Hello and welcome to The Good Time Show. I'm your host, Damon Epps. Today, I'd like to introduce Alison De La Husse, one of the founders of The Women of Oz, a trailblazing organization empowering women on and off the trail. We'll also explore her fascinating career as a sports and documentary producer, including some behind the scenes moments from the iconic Jerry Springer show. She also ran for Bentonville City Council. And now to tell us all about the Northwest Arkansas biking scene, Alison De La Husse. Yeah, you pretty much That's covered right. it. That's right, because I do my, I do, you know, I got this thing called Google. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, okay, so we might as well dive into the Women of Oz and like, what it. is the Women of Oz and what it's about? I know my girlfriend likes the Women of Oz now, so I'm excited about so it. So glad to hear she's a member. Yeah, I'm a fan of. I'm I'm excited for her to be. A, I'm a. I'm not excited that I don't have a place to go. And well, maybe it's time to start the Men of Oz. Maybe. Yeah, I'm yeah. looking for, I need not just the the men of Oz. I need, like, the men of Oz that aren't ready to really make it happen. Yeah, I maybe need, like, you need, the like... Junior, the junior classes. <laughs> like, well, kind of, like, I guess your, your part of the Women of Oz is to make you feel like you're included and that yeah. anybody can get on a bike. That's right. So maybe I do need to support the men of Oz. You are always welcome to Women of Oz, but the only rule is you have to ride in the back. Well, that happens anyway. <laughs> yeah, you can come anytime. <laughs> that's the deal. I ride in the back all the time. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 I've been the last place guy my whole life. I, I've been, I'm a fat asthmatic. That's, well, you certainly make like, up for it in personality. Oh, see, that's, so. yeah, that's, I'm pretty and have a personality. Yeah. Because, you know, I'm, I'm good. Okay, so tell me about the Women of Oz. So the Women of Oz is a nonprofit, and we founded it in 2019 with the goal of getting women on mountain bikes by breaking down the barriers, which are education, intimidation, and equipment. So we identified these three things that we think were preventing women from enjoying these trails. You know, we have 250 miles of single track right here from downtown Bentonville. So that's how much it is. I don't, yeah. I don't know the statistics. And 600... I, I actually, that's actually fine. I can actually get all the stats from you about all the trails and everything. That yeah, and then we have 600 miles of gravel accessible from downtown. So, I mean, you can go from Fayetteville all the way to Missouri now on the Greenway. So there's endless possibilities for cycling here. And what we noticed is that women weren't opting into it. And so it kind of started because we wanted to learn how to ride and we wanted to have other women to ride with. So it was a very self-fulfilling goal. Um, so about there were about 40 of us who got together and there were pockets of women who were riding already and little groups had started and kind of died out and we just said we're going to do this and we're going to do it the first Saturday of every month and we're going to invite women and we're going to teach them and then we're going to build a community and we were able to do it but the thing that is most interesting so it is it started out really small you kind of just didn't even start, I mean I think the first ride 43 women showed up and we oh, pretty... we were like blown away like we couldn't believe that many women would want to come and you know we it's had one of those things where you go oh we're on to something yeah exactly and I think sometimes the most divine intervention inventions come out of the necessity right there was a necessity for women to have a place in cycling and we filled that gap and so i mean we were blown away and, and the first ride we set up actually there was about 25 of us and 15 of them were nika coaches which is the high school league and they had an event on that same day so we lost the only people who knew how to mountain bike and we were like, okay, how are we going to do this? But we knew we knew more than the women showing up. And so <laughs> that was enough. So you weren't like a pro? By no, now. by no means. I mean, I had no education. I had a broken arm at the time from cycling, actually. And so... Um, a very good resume. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> a little bit of street cred, I guess. But um, yeah, so it was really just a grassroots effort. And then we were able to create a nonprofit we applied for grants and we sent ladies to mountain bike school. Um, and I'm proud to report now we have 110 ride leaders that are trained internally through the Women of Oz program. We have 51 level one coaches, so certified mountain bike guides and coaches. Um, and we've had over 5,500 participants come through the program. So it's been incredible. That's crazy. Yeah. Look at your lightning just to make sure I'm not, I just all of a sudden panicked. Nope, we're it's all good. good. Oh, oh, shoot. Of oh, course, no, was good. I mean, I don't know what you're going for, but it looks central. So. Thank you. Still looks good? Yeah. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden I had a panic. I was like, oh, did I hit the record button? <laughs> you know what you're that's like. You're such a producer. <laughs> I know. I was like, but I was sitting over here. I was like, because we were just enjoying our talking beforehand. And I was like, did, oh. I, did I double punch it? Because that's happened to me before. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. Shoot. Double punch. 
what made you want to do this? Like, I mean, I know that I, just all of a sudden you were out here and you just felt yeah. like women needed the support. And Well, I mean, you, uh, I don't know if, if people who don't live in Northwest west arkansas know this but it's a town with a lot of transplants right and so right. and walmart is the biggest uh company in town and so when i moved here i came as a spouse for someone who worked at walmart and it was hard for me to leave a career in chicago in my friend group and come here and then i was just the wife right so i was looking for a community i was looking for a way to connect with women i was bored to death talking about diapers and breastfeeding and i was just like oh god i can't have another conversation like this I just can't. And so for me to find a group of women that were out in the community doing things like really interesting, neat ladies, and then do a sport together was just beyond. I mean, I grew up as an athlete. I played college soccer for a okay. year. And so for I me- you were an athlete. I, I was gonna ask, I, yeah. I to know which, which sport were you? Any sport I could play. I did oh, really? everything, but mostly soccer and swimming by the time I got through high school. So um, for me, it was just about looking for community. And and like you said, you know, we found that, wow, there really is an opportunity here. Women are looking for this. And so now you're seeing these ladies and they have developed best friends and their families vacation together and they celebrate birthdays together. And when there are hard times, they support each other. It's just the byproduct of it has been unbelievable. I'm a transplant here because of Walmart. I mean, I came here because of Aaron. So I, I yeah. came here for a girl. So um, same it, story, right? same story. Yeah. How long have you been here? Oh, 10 years. 10 years. So yeah. Seen the growth. Oh yeah. It's been, it's been unbelievable. I mean, when we moved here, we didn't even have a Chipotle. That's a big change from a city girl. I'm like that's a benchmark. I'm pretty sure. That's a benchmark. So, um, yeah, it's, it's been really neat and it truly is one of the most exciting times to be in this community. I think the growth and the ability we have to shape what's coming. You know, people are saying we're going to be the next Austin. Well, I think we're going to be the next Bentonville. And I'm really excited yeah. to be a part of that because yeah, it is a unique community. So funny how worried people are of becoming like, like, it's so funny. People just concentrate on just the bad things of what's happened to a city. And they're like, well, I hope we don't get too big and turn into right. like Austin. Now. I'm like, guys, we have like a hundred years before we turn into Austin. Right. Um, but somebody actually told me this stat um, recently that. Because I would go to Austin, what, in 1985? And there was, yeah. you know, back in 1985 or 87, you know, I was from Dallas, Fort Lauderdale. LA. Um, so I would go, I would go to Austin all the time. And in like 1991 or something like that, there was 500,000 people in Austin County. Wow. And Austin County is actually almost the same size as Northwest Arkansas. Wow. Okay. But I think this town is completely different. I mean, the culture is completely different. I think yeah. that this town has the ability, like you couldn't really... The way they built Austin, you couldn't really do what they've done and put so much yeah. traffic. It was already, but here I think we can develop it correctly. At least it feels like it. Everyone here kind of talks about traffic, but there's no traffic I, here. Well, that's you wait, you never, wait, yeah, you wait ten minutes is not traffic. You know, they've like, never lived in a city, right? Right. You know, people are like, well, there's traffic. You know what I'm saying? I go, you, <laughs> it took you fifteen minutes total to get home from Rogers. Like it's not. There right. was there was there were cars in your way and you had to wait a little bit. But there's no traffic. I know they don't know. They don't know. Okay, I have a question for you though, Let's just on the subject. Please. Uh, and I did want to say, you know, Austin, the transition started like in the '70s. So yeah. for everyone who's worried about the future of Bentonville, you got like 50 years before 50 years. it really things have really changed. Okay, <laughs> yeah. so hang on, you're gonna make it. It's gonna be fine. Just, and yeah, and the school's way over there, so yeah. like we don't even have that Exa problem with like all the students exactly. running around. Exactly, like it's it's still going to be an adult land with like it's just, it's right. just not even the same. Just relax. It's, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. Yeah. Okay. My question to you yes. is: Before you ever visited here and you heard Arkansas, what did you picture? Oh, I mean, just like what everybody kind of pictures with Arkansas. I mean, I I mean, I'm from Texas, and I've got yeah. some. I've got some pretty country relatives out there in East Texas, you know, so I, I am, I'm redneck adjacent. So, yeah. um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I ever even thought about Arkansas, to be honest with you. I don't even know. I think it was just a place where I was like, nah, or, you know, like, uh, I, yeah, I mean, the Ozarks, I mean, like, you know, yeah. the, yeah, I don't, I, I think what I thought with everybody, it wasn't necessarily pleasant when you thought about Arkansas, um, but, how but I don't know if I ever really thought about it, whether it was negative or positive. I just kind yeah. of 
Never thought I would ever go. Yeah. But now how would you describe it? It's a gym. It's yeah. just a gym. And like with the Waltons doing what they're doing, I mean, I don't know of another place in America that has this much wealth in this small of an area. That like, they give back. That they give know? back. I mean, I mean they're they they're doing they're incredible invested. things. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're right there. I mean, it's just, it's really neat to see the way that Walmart and the Waltons support and the hunts, they all give back to this community. Yeah. So it's pretty great. Yeah, I just went to the Innovation Center. I don't know if you've been down there in the mm -hmm. Fayetteville, but they have um, truck simulators to teach you how to drive an no. eight wheeler. They have a flight really? simulator to teach you how to fly. They have wow. excavator. Uh, so you can go and learn all this tractor equipment. That's really unbelievable. So, okay, so let's talk yeah. about the past a little bit. So you yeah. were a, you were also a television producer. Yes. I thought which the, talk show? The Jerry Springer Show. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, that's right. You were Jerry, 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 Jerry. Just for all you people so, out there, Jerry Springer is actually a lovely man. I uh, worked with him on America's Got Talent, and I will move on from that, but go ahead. And I have to say, it was truly the hardest job I've ever had in my entire life so, because... To get someone to come on a talk show, especially Jerry Springer, to hear a secret is not an easy sell. So, um... And they've seen the show. They've seen... The, yeah. I mean... And at that was point... This, was this early on? So Jerry? this was, like, the height. Number one in the ratings. Beating Oprah. It was an unbelievable time to be with the show. Um, and so, you know, we just would, I would sit there all day with a headset on, just finding stories, just chasing any lead you have from the 1-800-96-JERRY carts, you know, people would leave messages and you just call back and then, you know, inevitably there'd be a prank and you get some angry mom. And, um, but anyhow, I mean, it was probably the hardest job I ever had. And it taught me the value of hard work, and communication styles, and really just producing. I mean, you had to take at the end of the week you needed to show one way or the other so you had to figure out how to put it together and so um it was a it was an unbelievable experience so i did that for about a year and then moved over to documentaries okay so then i started working for um i worked for a broad a company that did documentaries for broadcast companies in chicago so we did national geographic a &E, history channel weather channel Storm Stories, um, Animal Planet, all of it. No documentaries and reality TV. Reality TV is just a documentary on hyperdrive. We yeah. have, instead of getting four months to shoot a content, we get six weeks and you just- Yeah, because I mean, you've got to take average people and make them interesting and then create a storyline. So you can only imagine the amount of nudging that needs to happen. It's it's a thing. Yeah. It's a thing. I'm real good at it. Oh, I bet you are. Yeah. It's, it's fun. I, I enjoy, I enjoy dating shows more than anything. I, I really, 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 they're real hard. Um, people always think people are faking it on dating shows. If the producers are good, you really because yeah. you've casted the right people, right? You've casted right. people that are looking for love. You've casted now. Of course, you have some insane people that we're not idiots. We're going to load the deck a little bit, but you hope that the person that you've casted for the main wants to go right. through the process and all that kind of stuff. So they all end up falling in love. And if they don't, I usually can figure out how to make them fall in love. When I worked at Springer, it was like a well-known thing that there were these people that were talk show like groupies and they yes. all, they would try to jump from show to show. Yep. So I'd always ask them like, have you been on any other talk shows? And someone would be like, oh yeah, I've been on Ricky, I've been on yeah. Maury. And I'm like, negative, not going to take and you. Why, and why would they tell you? I was actually during the transition where I started getting fooled. In the beginning, it was yeah. really humble. Like it was really wonderful because no matter how crazy the show was, people fell for everything. I mean, they did, and we didn't know what we were doing. We would just lock people in a house and be like, I don't know what we're doing. None of us yeah. did. The producer yeah. didn't know what we are doing. Like it was so early on with reality TV, we're like, yeah, I mean, The Bachelor had just come out like a year and a half beforehand. So yeah. the rules of reality TV happened because everybody was screwing up things at The Bachelor and they were like, oh, we probably shouldn't do that. You know, yeah. somebody's gonna get killed. Oh, let's get security. <laughs> you, know, it's well, like... you know, that's about the time that I got out of documentary. It was like when, Amy was really buying more of Dog the Bounty Hunter than like a factual documentary show. Yes. So you went from trying to figure out how to put chiclets in people's teeth to make oh, them look good on camera hey. to <laughs> real life documentary because I yeah, yeah to covering like Pan Am Flight 103 that blew up over Lockerbie, Scotland, like just unbelievable, like these huge moments in history, like the conspiracy theories around Princess Diana's death, and you're speaking to her friends and family. I mean, that's just unbelievable. Wow. 
I do have a fun fact about Jerry Springer. So when we have the show, we always have like the chairs and they're lined up. But every once in a while, we had to go get a special chair, which was a double wide chair reserved for our biggest of big guests. I love the big chair. When reality TV came in, right, the people were for sure like pure and innocent and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then they came in with like agendas and strategies because they, had, sure. they started to learn all our tricks. They started to learn like what we were doing and like what the process was. And so I was sitting down with these people thinking everything was organic and real, but they were coming in as characters. Yeah. And then one day during the middle of a show, I realized that this new character was best friends with a character who had just gotten off the show. Uh, and they were like in the same, you know, it was the nightclub time where everybody was, Jersey, <laughs> you know, it was pre-even Jersey Shore. It was like shot a little with tequila, turning into like Tool Academy. Yeah. So it was all these douchebag guys. But, you know, they were all like talking and they were like, oh, would you do this? You need to do this, you whatever. And I, the, the thing that I hold true to reality that I think makes a great story is I try to get people to just be themselves and to make really quick choices. It yeah. doesn't matter what they, because they can't control what the other people are thinking. Right. So they can control, they think that they've got it all down, but then yeah. if they've made everybody mad on the set, all of a sudden they weren't they weren't expecting everybody in the world to hate them yeah because they still think that because their egos are so big so you think that everybody's like pure and innocent and all that kind of stuff well i know the doctor from biggest loser um yeah. sorry dr Hazinga, whatever and <laughs> you realize that you know you look at them and you're like oh my god they're so sweet and whatever these people are in there trying to cheat they're bringing <laughs> no. like they are too they're what? like they're bringing like diuretics, like hidden in their bags. No, yes, they do before they for their weigh-ins. Yeah, for their weigh-ins. Okay, but let me ask him. Do you think a producer pushed them to do that? No, never. No, because like it's no, because like it it doesn't serve the producers. Don't care. You've 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 obviously casted somebody that's one hundred and ninety pounds overweight. I mean, it's yeah. not like you don't care if they're one hundred fifty pounds overweight or one hundred sixty or one hundred eighty. Like. It, I mean, they're big enough. They yeah. passed. You know, we've had like some shady stuff happen in reality TV. You're always like searching bags. You know, there's a whole oh, process yeah. and we have people come in. But yeah, like, I mean, people like also try to gain like 30 pounds right before they no. start the show. And stuff. so you think that people are just these sweet little people. But at the end of the day, some of them are. A lot of them are. But don't Most you... of them are. But there's there is an agenda with some of these people. Oh boy, reality TV and documentaries. And where is it gonna go? Where is television gonna go? I have no boy. idea right now. If I would have known better, I should have just become a DJ. <laughs> I been like DJ Epps. You know what? There's, there's still time. There's still not really. <laughs> you missed not your really. window. Now, like I'm over there DJing like do you do anything with television anymore? Are you trying to do anything with like, or are you just, um, you love to tell stories. Yeah. I mean, you just love people like you, I love connecting with people. And I think that's like what really energizes me. Last year we put together like the beginning of a short doc about women of Oz. I think it would be fun to tell that story. I've got a great story. So I used to do these, um, on demand. It was on demand content, everything from like where to eat animals up for adoption. And we did dating profiles. And the idea was this was like, mid like 2007 like mid 2000s and the idea was that anybody who had comcast could go on demand and watch these profiles and then email them if they were interested and i met this guy um doing these interviews think about chicago it's like you know 11 million people and i'm at this restaurant interviewing these guys and this guy was just he was really funny but like just kind of funny i think he had had a lot to drink and i'm asking him like describe his dream woman and he just starts describing me because i think he's like oh, over you know solid move though right i know solid it was a good it's actually a terrible move <laughs> but i know the move very well <laughs> totally in fact we just did a thing here at blake street where it was like silent like dating and like, oh yeah and it just got weird then three months later I'm on an airplane, sitting next to the guy, we start chatting, we end up going out for dinner the following week. Same guy, same guy, we end up on an airplane next to each other, end up marrying him. So the so. douchebag you married. <laughs> no, I'm Turned kidding. out to be a great no, guy I'm in the kidding. end. I think he had just been overserved the first night. So, but it's like one of those things I feel like the universe tried to put us together, didn't work, put us together back. again, and it did work this time. So. Um, so yeah, that was my, that was the best dating on demand profile I ever did. That's really funny. Yeah. So we've been married now 13 years and we have three kids together. That's great. Yeah. So that's it. So you then, never know who, how it's going to work or, no. you know, I don't know. 
Who would have thought that your relationship was going to bring you here to Bentonville? Right. I sure did not. I sure did not. You know, I came here in 2007 because I was doing a documentary about the Purdue chicken family. They actually taught the Tysons how to chicken farm, which a lot of people don't know. They oh. gave the Tysons their start. They were friends. It's really neat to see that the way that those two had supported each other a long time ago when Frank started Purdue Chicken. I came here in 2007 to so interview. They, so they, he taught. He taught them. Yeah, they they came up to Delaware where the Purdue's were and watched them chicken farm and learned how to do it. And so, um, and then of course surpassed them to become, I think Tyson's number one, Purdue was like number three. But in that process, I came to Arkansas to interview John Tyson. And uh, so then when my husband... It, that was 2007. So then in 2013, he's like, what do you think about Bentonville? And I was like, let me be honest, I don't think about Bentonville ever. So it was a real surprise to me to become an Arkansian. I moved here two years ago. But the amount of change that's happened just in two years is, yeah. is crazy. I don't think there was anything here five years ago. I mean, I just, people, <laughs> I know there was a couple of things, but there, you know, everyone goes, oh yeah, but there was Crystal Bridges. I'm like, okay, there was two mm -hmm. restaurants and there was Crystal Bridges. It but was... I would not have moved here five years ago. You know, my friends were trying to cheer me up and they were like, hey, you know, we've been Googling and here are the things to do in Bentonville. And it was like Crystal Bridges. <laughs> there wasn't even mountain biking then. Right. I mean, I think they maybe had like four miles trail. And then the other thing was like a train depot in downtown Rogers the, and U of A. Those were the only things they could find 10 years ago. Right. Now, if you were to Google it, it's, it's insane. It's unbelievable. Which I do want to talk to you more about biking because I want to dig into that. Um like the community of biking and then yeah. just Crystal Bridges, now doubling the size of Crystal Bridges, and then all these incredible restaurants. These these restaurants, I mean, this place reminds me of Breckenridge or Aspen. Yeah. That's what it reminds me of now. And yeah. five years ago, this place was not Aspen. And now all these music people are coming. I know, Snoop it's Snoop Dogg's so coming, great. Wu Tang Clan. Yeah, so you know what it used to be? It used to be that we'd only get the music acts on a Sunday because they'd be coming through on their tour right. bus. And they're like, ah, oh, yeah, we'll throw a Sunday out to Arkansas. Right. But now it's like you're getting these great bands. It's really fun just to see the growth from overall from a um, an enrichment perspective. I mean, it's like the cycling and the music and the arts and the restaurants. Like, it's all growing. Yeah, it's all growing. Okay, let's get let's get in. Speaking of growing, yeah, you know a lot about the mountain biking and the trails and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. What do you know about because from where it because what you, you just threw up the number a minute ago of like how many miles. Yeah. Give me some stats of like, I mean, I just bought a really nice mountain bike from the um, specialized. Um, Fantastic. Uh, in, what is it? The uh, experience the center. Experience center. They are the preferred experience uh, flagship, Women of Oz flagship experience partner. I bought a really nice bike that I shouldn't, you know, I mean, I should have. But I definitely got talked into buying a really nice electric mountain bike, which I'm yes. super stoked about it. I mean, it definitely Good. changes how you ride. Um, you know, it's great. You know, you I love that people think it's cheating and they it's... think I feel bad about it. First, I've cheated on every test I've ever done. Life, so I don't know what. Who, yeah, I don't know. Who, yeah, I don't know who they think they're talking to. I <laughs> I graduated college because of cheating, and I became a television producer. <laughs> I still lie. I cheat. No, I'm kidding. Um, well, I'm kind of kidding, but. Like this now, it's like now it's like skiing. I, I yeah. can go, you know, I can work as hard as I want to, and the minute I'm about to die, I click it on, I go yeah. to the top, and then I have a fun time riding. And you can ride for like six hours, and yeah. so then I'm enjoying the whole time. The thing with an e bike, though, is what it really does is it opens the sport up to so many more people, and that's what we want. We don't want people to sit on the sidelines, we want them to join in. And so an e-bike provides the opportunity for you to ride all day long or someone who might not be able to ride or ride as far to get that opportunity. So I love that we're an e-bike friendly community. A lot of communities out West are not, it's illegal. So it's great to see that growing here. And I think this fall People for Bikes is going to be having um, an e-bike summit here. So oh. all of the leaders in e-biking will be here. Give me some stats of where we are now, I guess, with mountain biking and the Greenway and like what it's going to be like in the future and what like what's happening. I think we add like one mile of trail a week was the statistic when they take like the whole year and extract it out. And that's just like unheard of 
you know, that's not happening anywhere else because of the investment of the Walton Family Foundation. I think trails will continue to grow. Um, the gravel scene is huge here. I don't know if you've been gravel riding. I haven't. It's basically just what it sounds like riding on dirt roads. And if you think about a road bike and a mountain bike, it's like right in the middle of the two. The geometry is similar to a road bike, but the tire width and the knobbiness is like in between a mountain and a road tire. So it's sort of a medium tire. Um, and that sport is really growing. There is a rule of three, which is um, put on by Lauren Pickman and Andy Chastain. Lauren is a Woman of Oz founder and okay. now the new executive director. This is an unbelievable race. Um, the last two years they've done it. It's rained and it's been cold and horrible. And um, Lance Armstrong comes every year to ride oh. it. It's just, it's unbelievable. So they're in Lifetime is throwing a mountain bike event this fall and a gravel event. So there's endless opportunities to get plugged in. And there's Women of Oz. There is a women's gravel group called the Gravel Collective. There's a women's road group. I don't know what the guys are up to, but the ladies are busy. The ladies are killing it. I, you know what I want to know about? I want to know about the Greenway because yeah. I've, I've ridden the Greenway, but eventually the Greenway is going to be, because parts of the Greenway get a little hairy because you got to be on the roads and all that kind of stuff yeah. right now, right? Is that going to change? Are they going to start? Are they going to uh, figure out? I think the goal is to continue to add more Greenway, always. If you go to um, Bentonville Parks and Rec, you can download, there's like a pedestrian master plan, and they've got it mapped out for like five to ten years of what they're going to do for growth and implementation. Um, but right now, like I said, you can go from... Uh, Missouri all the way to Fayetteville and if you haven't square to square is an awesome event and it goes from Bentonville yet. square to Fayetteville square and then it reverses in the fall great way to try the Greenway out and there's stops along the way with like polka bands and snacks and it's just so fun um, but yeah you can ride that Greenway especially on that e-bike ride it to well, Fayetteville now that, I was gonna say, now that I have the e-bike I I'm really excited about doing the square to square because yeah it's a much that sounds like my kind of kind yeah of it's really fun and festive and do it with a group and it's just a blast so if you haven't gone all the way to Fayetteville by Greenway you need to there's some beautiful parts what's your favorite part about mountain biking you know I like all bikes because they all make you smile no okay. matter which one I mean I've got I like I used to like to ride um road biking I got into yeah. it because you know it was there in the Lamps Armstrong days we, yeah uh, that was from Texas and Anytime he would get on stage, he would be like, where are you from? And I'd be like, United States, Italy. And Lance would always go, Texas. So I got into it. I used to drink wine. Everybody drank beer. We were like, had the little <laughs> stupid habits and like whatever. Um, we were literally those guys. And it was me and my friend. And nobody else was into biking except for me and my buddy. Yeah. And uh, I really tried to get into it. But I legitimately am so ADD that if I get on a bike too long, I just start not paying attention. And Yeah, it's, that could it's, be hazardous. It's a little it's a little dangerous for me to, yeah. to road bike. Yeah, Mountain biking keeps me on point. Road bike's great, but uh, I don't know. I think mountain biking is way more engaging. I mean, you have to really be mentally engaged, preparing for what's coming up or unexpected things that occur, and you need quick reaction. And so you can't be in la-la land. You have to be right. focused. And that's kind of part of the fun. I mean, besides all the health benefits, right? Like you're getting that endorphin boost and you're getting that vitamin D, but also like you're mentally challenging yourself. For women, um, we don't have a seat at the table sometimes with the good old boys clubs, but I think cycling is changing that. Women can do business on bikes too. And it's mm -hmm. no longer that good old boys club at the golf course. It's like, oh, we're all going on mountain bikes together. It's been a really neat opportunity to create a new way for women to do business. So I hope to see that continue, especially as Walmart tries to push their 10% mobility goal. Um, I think it'll be fun to see like how this community can change the way that they're not only socializing, but doing business. So, okay, talk to me about why we're getting into politics now. Do we want yeah, to talk about politics? Sure, why not? Why not? This fall, I ran for city council, and my whole goal was, after trying to advocate for safer sidewalk crossings for my kids to school, I realized that there's a lot of work to be done in this community, and I think we need the right people at the helm. And it's like we talked about, there's so much growth, but there also are, are so many beautiful parts about this community that need to be preserved. So I think you need smart leadership that can represent the larger community. So um, that's why I threw my hat in the ring. It was an unbelievable experience. Went great. Could have gone 7% better. Oh, if you only lost by 7%? Set, yeah, 7%. Wow, that's not much. You know, now I'm working 
with the Mayor's Community Council. So it's a one-year program where you meet with the, all the different civic leaders and kind of like an internship of Bentonville government. So I'm hoping oh, really? there'll be future opportunities to do that. do that. It's super cool. Yeah, you can apply um, next November for the following year's class. It's an unbelievable way to meet Parks and Rec and the library and, you know, water and waste. Like these people who really are shaping your community. So it's been fun. That's really it. Only 7%. 7%. I know. Is that a gut punch or what? I have this idea that I want to get into politics. I have no idea yeah. how you get into politics. Well, I'll be happy to sit down and have a conversation with you because it really was a, a learning experience. And I, the thing that was most surprising to me is you're running in a nonpartisan position. People will ask you your political views and they will ask you questions and that have nothing to do with how you run. They just want to know, are you conservative or are you a liberal? That's how I vote. It doesn't matter it's, anything else. You know, I'm a Texan that lived in Hollywood for 25 years. And I've interviewed <laughs> yeah. thousands of people. And once you cut away all the garbage, most everybody gets along with each other if, if they uh, don't ever talk about the nonsense. I agree. Like if you turn off the news, we're all kind of, everybody's pretty much in the middle. They just don't know they are. They might be angry about one thing, but, you know, it's like... You, 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 know, you just concentrate on that one thing, then you're going to never get along. No one's, we're all from different places and different beliefs. And like, yeah. it's just, I don't know. How about agree to disagree? Why have we agree forgotten that? Just, you know, I, angry. I remember talking to my campaign managers like, well, I'm very, I mean, I'm conservative, but I'm also moderate as well. There, I'm socially conservative or socially liberal but i'm fiscally conservative like i'm truly right down the middle and isn't that what we need for leadership and they said absolutely not yeah they you say will not, not win like that you have to go extreme one way or the other you know what i hate though is that like people keep saying that and i disagree there's going to be someone that is going to win the other way i i, I could be wrong but eventually maybe it'll be you yeah maybe but just tell people what you believe if you if it goes the wrong way then you go <laughs> who cares okay yeah. i've lost a lot of things but you know most people care i just believe in people i really do i legitimately have been in the craziest places in the south like doing the craziest party oh, shows and much. then i've been in the craziest like you know i've been in you know the craziest gay pride parades in the world you know it's like and all of it's fun i i meet wonderful people from yeah. all walks of life that if i disagree with somebody the way they do it doesn't matter they're taking care of their kids usually now, if they're really terrible people, then it doesn't matter what their <laughs> people Just are. Like then there are terrible people. But most people aren't. I, yeah. there's, I have a lot of my friends who are like, oh, Barry, the world's bad. I was like, I don't see it. I, I literally, I talk to a lot of people. I, I, I get up in the morning and I, I, I plan on talking to a ton of people every day. And I like to get to know <laughs> people. And I don't meet terrible people. I really well, don't. Look, I mean, it's just like everyone has a story, right? And oftentimes when people are acting... Uh, cagey or mean or whatever it's rooted in fear like that's it. it is fear and I think unfortunately the political scene has gotten to a point where it is now like this fear mongling and like what is yours is going to be taken unless you stand up on both sides they're doing it. They're, it, both of them are doing and it. it's just it's unbelievably sad because we can do so much more work together so you're gonna run again I don't know what's the future hold for the women of Oz Women, I'm so glad you asked. We are doing our second annual Women of Oz Sunset Summit. It is the best of the best in women's coaching from across the world. Come to Bentonville. As a participant, you get to experience one coach one morning, and then you rotate and do another coach the next morning. And we're talking about, like, Annika Bearton, um, this group from out west called Ladies All Ride, Angie Weston, biggest names in women's cycling, and, of course, Women of Oz coaching team. Ben Bike School Bentonville will be there. And... Um, the opportunity is to not only get more education, but bring the women's cycling community together and prop each other up. Because I think there's, we could always use more of that. So that's going to be happening in September. It's our second year. Um, and then we'll have speakers and some lifestyle programming. It's going to be at the momentary, beautiful, beautiful backdrop. So we're looking forward to it. And I don't know, that's our biggest objective this year. And then, and that is a fundraising opportunity for our organization being a nonprofit. So Really, if anyone in the community wants to come and support it and be a sponsor or be a part of it, we'd encourage that. Um, and then on that, just our monthly flagships, which are open to any women, all abilities, all ages. Our bike partner specialized can help you get set up with a bike and then we'll do the rest.
You just gotta show up. You just gotta show up. Yeah. I love Specialized. I love those guys over there. They do a great job. They better love me because I, I think I sold them eighty thousand dollars worth of mine. <laughs> I think it's... Yeah, it's you know we're really lucky to have someone like Specialized come into town and set up an experience center in the Ledger. It's just it's a really neat addition to the landscape. Okay, I should probably wrap and go get my kids. Okay, yeah, you should go get your kids. Okay, yeah. so um, thank you for so much for coming on the show. This has been so fun. It's I... always fun to sit and just like chat shop with you. And I, yeah, pick I, your brain and I feel like I could sit here for hours. I hope, well, that's the reason why I do this. I really enjoy it. I think, uh, yeah. I hope you had a good time. I did. Okay. What a gift to the community. Well, thank you for uh, coming on the Good Time Show and to everybody else, I hope you have a good time. Well, that's our show. If you didn't get a chance to watch the episode, check it out on YouTube and Spotify. You can also listen to the Good Time Show on Apple Podcasts or any other platform. We are always trying to grow our Planet Good Times community, so subscribe and follow us at Good Times Us on almost all social media platforms. This episode was presented and recorded live at Blake Street House Sound Lounge in Bentonville, Arkansas, a social club where people from all walks of life come together just to be themselves and make the community a better place. Till next time, good times, everybody.